Good evening y bienvenidos a Chicago Tonight Latino Voices. I'm Alex Hernandez of Noticias Univision Chicago. We cherish every weekday morning at 5 and 6. Thank you for sharing part of your weekend with us on the show tonight. Homeowners in Pilsen are demanding relief from major property tax hikes. A look at potential solutions. A recent appeals court ruling allowing domestic abusers to own guns as advocacy groups sounding the alarm. Some residents are pushing back on a plan to incorporate a library with a development project in back of the yards neighborhood. We'll look at that. The Chicago International Salsa Congress twirls into town next week. We'll have the details on that as well. This is just what I love. And Carnival Chef Carlos Garza on what and who inspires him in the kitchen. All that coming up. But our first story tonight, housing trends amid spiking property taxes. That's right after this. Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, is made possible in part by the support of these donors. Homeowners in Pilsen are demanding relief following hikes in their property tax bills. Cook County's Board of Review data shows about 60% 3% property tax increase in the Lower West Side community area, which includes the Pilsen neighborhood. Now, county officials are launching a series of workshops to show residents how to file for exemptions or appeal those assessments. Joining us now with more on possible solutions to these hikes and neighborhood housing trends are Teresa Fraga, leader of the Pilsen Neighbors Community Council, Cook County Board of Review Commissioner George Cárdenas, and Jeff Smith, Executive Director of the Institute for Housing Studies at the Paul University, and I want to welcome all for joining us today. But I want to start with you, Teresa. We know, as a longtime homeowner in Pilsen, you've actually um, were uh, impacted by the recent uh, property tax hikes. Talk to us about that. Yes, I was. First week of December, I received my tax bill, and uh, when I opened it, I, I when I saw it, I said, "This is a mistake." I was expecting about a 2,500 bill, and when I looked at it, 14,279, unbelievable. I was confident that it was a mistake, but I still kept it to myself over the weekend, and I didn't tell my family till Sunday night. I started calling on Monday uh, a couple of relatives, a neighbor, and realized that it was just not my bill. So. I had a meeting about six people, and then the next day we had 25 people at the work park, and I called uh, our executive director of Pilsen Neighbors. I said, this is an issue. I need you to come here. So within less than five days, we had 500, close to 500 uh, residents, taxpayers at the work park. So you were inspired to mobilize uh, with your community and to do something about it? Well, as a leader with Pilsen Neighbors, you, you need to recognize first when an issue is, when it is an issue that affects many other people, and right. that was the case. So that's how we started organizing other uh, relationships and partners in the community, uh, like, you know, TRP and uh, Alivio Medical Center, and uh, it, it just snowballed. Commissioner Cardenas, you recently met with the Pilsen uh, community uh, as well, along with Assessor Fritz uh, Kage through a public meeting. What did you take away from that meeting? Um, what needs to be done? Well, obviously the, the, the anger, um, uh, the outrage that, that comes from getting something that you're not expecting. Um, it's not normal. I mean, you know, everybody's on a budget. Um, and, and folks that are receiving such a such a large amount um, it, it's really insulting because you just can't believe something like this could happen and most of the time people say you know it's got to be a mistake and a lot of times it is a mistake but it's a mistake because of the system and, and, and the way uh, we are valuing market um, the modeling I think that we're using um, uh, is not doing us any justice and so we got to go back to the drawing board exactly to see what's what's working and what's not working uh, there's a lot of blame uh, going around. There's a blame game happening. Uh, but we got to put that aside because even if, if that would be included, it doesn't explain the his significant hikes in property taxes for a community like Pilsen. And if you look at the map that you just uh, showed, 
uh, is very dark green. It shows that uh, Pilsen is the highest in the entire city facing uh, property tax hikes. Now, I know it's a beautiful neighborhood. It's a hard neighborhood, mm -hmm. but there's no way you can explain someone that owns a two-flat that was paying $3,000 now with a tax bill of $15,000 on the second installment, mind you, not even not even the sort of a, an average, is the second installment that's the, more the kicker. Uh, it just got reassessed, West Township got reassessed, and this is what you're seeing as a result of that. So it increased on average of 63% from the last assessment to this, uh, it's three-year assessment cycle. Uh, it shows you that, that Pilsen, to me, um, I think it's, it's um, over-assessed. Mm -hmm. uh, the market changes, as you know, and I think whatever market forces were, were happening, it's certainly not the same right now as with high interest right. rates. So it can change on the dime as it happened in 2008 and 2009, and I think we've got to go back to the drawing board. There's definitely a lot that can be done to help uh, uh, Pilsen residents, no doubt. Uh, that brings me uh, to you, Jeff. Uh, actually, one of the factors these tax uh, bills rely on is the neighborhood uh, housing market. What housing uh, market trends have you seen in Pilsen and other working class communities? So one of the, the big challenges in a neighborhood like Pilsen is that property values in the neighborhood have ri risen much more rapidly than prices citywide. So um, that more rapid increase means that property owners in neighborhoods like Pilsen bear a growing share of the property tax burden. Um, and that's a real challenge for uh, long-term owners like Teresa and, and others who have lived in the neighborhood for 20 plus years, purchased their homes at modest prices, and in some ways benefit from, in a lot of ways benefit from that value appreciation and the home equity that, that comes along with it. But mm -hmm. the cost is that there is an increased tax burden that may destabilize uh, their housing situation. So I think that, that that's the real real challenge in situations right. like this. What do, you, what do you think it's drawing people uh, to Pilsen? What's, what's driving these sales? I mean, you know, Pilsen has been a neighborhood that has been talked about as gentrifying for, for decades. Um, and I think what happened in the last probably 10 years or so is that uh, investment has really started to accelerate in the neighborhood uh, due to its proximity to downtown, proximity to places like University of Illinois Chicago, access to transit, um, a great housing stock, a vibrant you know, commercial corridor, you know, all, all of those things make it an attractive neighborhood. And, and when you, and it's always been an attractive neighborhood, but you're adding on what's happened recently, which is ex mm -hmm. you know, a lot more outside investment uh, driving um, increased prices. Definitely. That is, I want to go back with you and talk about the uh, workshops that are uh, going on uh, in the area as part of the push for, for relief. But uh, what further changes would you like to see down the road? Well, first of all, yes, Pilsen has been very difficult to gentrify from the outside. Uh, and that's because of the work of the community, the work of the residents basically uh, rebuilt Pilsen in the 70s after the Chicago 21 plan was stopped, and it was stopped by Pilsen. So this is a community that has really pulled itself up from, its, from the bootstraps, and that's what makes people so angry. It makes me angry to know that, uh, to know that we're in this situation mm -hmm. and that we have fought. Uh, we're not fighting gentrification. We're fighting to stay in what we own. But uh, what we need to see, I, the workshops are, are something immediate, and that's necessary. And we're working hard to get right. people to come to the workshops. Definitely. That's they, just the immediate. But then, then there's the, uh, the interest uh, that people who didn't quite pay all the bill, there should be no interest charged, and, and the scavenger sale or list mm -hmm. should be deactivated for, for this reason uh, in, in, in the present. Unfortunately, we're just out of time, less than 30 seconds, but uh, Commissioner Cardenas, I just want you with, um, to say a last message to the Pilsen community. Well, we're going to work hard to, to undo some of the over-assessments that, that are pretty apparent. Uh, and so my office is going to be diligent in looking at every fee appeal and every case. And we got to look at uh, um, market forces and what that means. Uh, if you own stock and if you play the market, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Wall Street, uh, you don't get taxed on, on unrealized gains. And, and our people uh, live there. This is not uh, stock. This is not something that you play with. 
and yet we are doing that. We're, we're making them, uh, we're making well, people pay for that. Everyone's looking very closely at what's happening in the area, definitely. So I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, George Cardenas, Teresa Fraga, and Jeff Smith. Thank you so much. There's a fight brewing over a new public library in the back of the yards neighborhood. Some neighbors are pushing back on a new proposal that would incorporate the library into a public housing project. Residents and students currently share a library inside Back of the Yards College Prep Academy. But for years, parents have advocated for a separate library for a more community access. Two years ago, state lawmaker Teresa Ma secured $15 million in state funding to help build a new standalone library in the area. But city officials have yet to finalize a location. Now, the Back of the Yards Neighborhood Council is proposing to incorporate the library as part of a new development project. The new construction is set to bring affordable housing, a healthcare center, and a performing arts center. But some residents have concerns and say sharing a library was not part of the plan. This all started because of all the issues of sharing space, parking, uh, different security issues, administrative issues. Uh, there's always something that came uh, because of that share space. So we fought for an independent standalone library and now for them to come back to another share location is kind of like that does not solve a problem. Now my fear is that if we don't do it now by the time we find the money we won't find a better location that supports the entire community. It, it could be a long long time. All four sides of this library will be independent. They can design it any way they want. They'll have you know entry and uh, egress and uh, through any walls that they want. This is Ashland Avenue so they'll have Ashland exposure. This is their own private deck. We actually reach out to the commissioner of the Chicago Public Library, but we have yet to hear back. We will definitely have more on this story on Chicago Tonight next week. A recent appeals court ruling says the Second Amendment allows people accused of domestic abuse to have guns. The ruling only applies in the 5th District of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. But advocates for survivors of domestic violence say the ruling makes abusive situations even more dangerous for victims. According to a Johns Hopkins study, a domestic violence victim's risk of death is five times higher when their abuser has access to a gun. And the nonprofit advocacy group Esperanza United says about one in three Latinas will experience intimate partner violence during her lifetime. Joining us now with more are Amanda Pyron, executive director of the Network Advocating Against Domestic Violence, Melanie Sketch, Program Manager of the Domestic Violence Program at the Guardian Angel Community Service, and Rebecca Weininger, Director of Domestic Violence, North Suburban Legal Aid Clinic. I want to uh, welcome all of you for joining us today, but I want to start with you, um, Amanda. How does uh, gun ownership affect domestic violence? Well, it increases the risk of lethality for a domestic violence survivor by 500%, as you've noted in a similar statistic in your introduction. Uh, survivors uh, are threatened even by the presence of a gun, whether it's used or not, just knowing that a firearm is there uh, increases the level of danger that they and potentially their children are experiencing. Uh, it affects their safety planning. It affects, you know, whether they decide to leave or whether they're too afraid to leave uh, and whether or not they reach out to family members or friends for support when they're afraid that those family members or friends might be caught up in firearm involved violence. Yeah. Rebecca, does the legal justification used in this ruling hold water in your view? Absolutely not. What it does is tries to interpret a Supreme Court uh, ruling that came down recently that, that requires judges to act as historians and puts them in an untenable position of having to decide whether there is a historical analog dating all the way back to 1791 when the Bill of Rights was ratified. And basically what it says is, was there gun regulation of this kind back in 1791? And as we all know, in 1791, the only people who were regulating guns were wealthy white men, property owners, that they did not anticipate re regulations that would protect women. Women were property. They weren't citizens. Or Latinas, Latinos, indigenous populations, black populations. Um, so what they're asking for courts to decide is something on a historic level that makes absolutely no sense for judges to decide and, and instead says regulations should only, gun regulations should only protect the political and social order. They should not protect individuals. 
And what is so ridiculously ironic about saying that is that as someone who has been deemed by a court uh, to be dangerous in the case, in this case, someone who has an order of protection against them, so a judge has already deemed them to be dangerous, um, is dangerous to the entire community. Mm -hmm. If we can't as a community say that someone who is dangerous to their intimate partner is dangerous to the whole community, then what is the point of a community at all? Wow. It's a great uh, question. Rebecca, uh, does the legal justification, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Melanie. <laughs> Melanie. Uh, back to you. Is, uh, is this concern just rooted in anti-gun sentiment? I don't believe so, no. I, I, there might be some of it in there, but we're also forgetting about the people who are getting involved in it and forgetting about the women involved and the families involved in community. So it may be starting out in that, um, that for some people, but I don't believe that anyone that does this work is starting it out as we just hate guns and we don't want anything to do with guns. I believe we're looking out for the safety of our families and our communities and those survivors that are dealing with this day to day. Amanda, the ruling affects only uh, three states, like we mentioned before, um, Texas, Mississippi, and Louisiana. Why should uh, residents in Illinois know about what's happening? Well, for one, I think it's a justice issue. You know, anything that could happen in one circuit could be applied nationally. Now, we're lucky that this ruling only focuses on the federal law and not any state laws in those three states. Uh, and we're lucky it only focuses on civil orders and not criminal behavior or conduct. But in Illinois, we have very, very strong domestic violence laws, particularly domestic violence laws relating to firearm ownership and the prohibition of that ownership if you're under a civil or criminal order of protection. People in Illinois should want to keep those laws. They should be reaching out to state legislators and asking how we can strengthen our laws and making sure that these protections stay in place so that any future challenges that arise at the Supreme Court only result in a federal decision and not in any changes to our state law. Same question, Rebecca. I think Illinois sh Illinoisans should be really concerned about this decision because this strikes down a federal prohibition on the ownership of guns by uh, domestic violence abusers. There is nothing that keeps an abuser in Illinois from crossing a state line. There is nothing magic about the borders between us and any of our sister states where there aren't these incredible restrictions. And what we see in the, in, in the statistics of gun violence in this state is that the majority of gun violence is perpetrated by guns that were not purchased in Illinois. So when you have a, 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 federal, a federal restriction that is, that is um, that is, that is struck down, that means that the state laws that protect us here in Illinois um, aren't, are only as good as the surrounding states that don't have those protections. And so people coming over the, over the border, either from here going into the other states or from st other states coming into Illinois, are not bound by those, by those uh, federal bans anymore. Melanie, what protections um, are in place currently for, for people fleeing domestic violence? Well, we already have um, the IDVA and other laws that are in place and the FOID card laws and such for these types of instances. But there, we have protections in communities and agencies that are out there willing to help and jump in and other um, domestic violence agencies or people like ourselves that are out there working. So we have a good support system. We need to continue building that and finding more people that want to join and help us and join in the movement of making sure everyone is safe. But we work with our local communities. For us ourselves, we work, work with the state's attorney and in Will County for where I work particularly. But we use all those places and the laws that we have already in place with the Floyd card laws and the firearm protections. Amanda, your organization is also uh, working on what you call a small fix to the uh, Illinois Domestic Violence Act. Can you explain that? Absolutely. What we're working on is to make sure that judges can implement the law, which means they need to understand the law. And right now there's some minor conflicts between the Illinois Domestic Violence Act and language in uh, the firearm restraining order. And we want to make sure that it's clear that survivors maintain the legal protections that they currently have in Illinois. A survivor in Illinois who gets a civil order of protection and requests that firearms be removed can have a judge that issues those firearms be removed with a warrant. Those firearms can be taken away immediately 
within 24 hours of getting an order of protection. We have great success with that in Cook. We want to make sure that survivors across the state can also access those protections. So again, we want to make sure that judges can implement what they understand. We want to make sure that it's clear to local law enforcement that when that warrant and the emergency order of protection come out, that they need to remove firearms from dangerous individuals because we know that leaving uh, is the most dangerous time for a survivor. And so we've got to act quickly, we've got to act thoughtfully, and we have everything we need on the books to make that happen. We just need to make sure it's clear for folks to understand. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, Amanda Pyron, Melanie Sketch, and Rebecca Weininger. Thank you so much. Thanks for Thank having you. us. Thank you. Back with more Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, right after this. When you're in charge of the kitchen at a 600-seat restaurant, a lot of thought has to go into every single plate that leaves the line. In a new series we're calling On the Pass, we're dishing with the local Latino chefs about what inspires their culinary approach, and then they're serving up the next chef for us to profile. Kicking it off, uh, the chef behind one of Chicago's most visible restaurants talks about the importance of consistency on the plate. It's a carne asada, very traditional, very popular in our culture. That's how we call our barbecue. I love the food I make because it connects culture. It connects people. It connects the roots of whatever you're coming from. Every time you throw something on a hot pan, it's like music for your ears. You just start feeling and hearing like and you throw some wine on it and the flame, the sound changes. And it, it's, it's just what I love. I will start thinking when, when I gotta change the menu. I start thinking about how it's gonna be on the plate. I'm gonna start putting pieces together just in mind. Now I have to think about the production and the, and the massive like this place, Carnival, which is a big restaurant. Before I get 10 orders of this plate, how did I want to train these cooks to make it the same way as I want? And the 10 guys are going to order that dish. It's going to have the same consistency, the same presentation, and the same flavors from number one to number 10. I got to tell you one thing. When you first start cooking in a restaurant as a new chef, you have to earn that respect, though, from cooks. Before becoming a good chef, you have to become a really good cook. That's when you earn that respect, and, and when they know that you are able to manage and guide a team. As our general manager says, it's like, you're a captain, then you are basically dealing a boat with a lot of pirates. They're not, not easy to manage. <laughs> There's people that is more like a Chicago thing, that once you find a dish that you like in a certain restaurant, you don't want to change. You just want to have the same dish all the time. And that's exactly what I promise. I try to deliver, not try, I deliver that promise just to, to do that. Cooking great food, then satisfy your soul, and then you feel like completely you know, your tank is filled. Mark Mendes is a uh, veteran in this industry, very passionate about his cooking, uh, very connected with farmers. He cooks, I see him, then he just loves to be behind the kitchen, behind the line, throwing the chicken or steak or lamb, whatever, and, and feeling very inspired. heard it, we'll meet Mark Mendes next time on The Pass. 
The International Salsa Congress is back for its 22nd year. The four-day celebration of Latin music and dance kicks off on February 16th with the free lessons for those who are just dipping their toes into the salsa dancing world. On opening night, which is Thursday night, we start with three free dance classes. Meet some people, laugh on the floor with them with some great teachers. And so there's, we start at 7.30 with a bachata class, intro to bachata. It's followed by an intro to salsa. And we have a Cuban reta, which is sort of like, I'll liken it to square dance a little bit. Then we have our concerts and social dancing to close the night out. Oh, you want to dance too? The Chicago International Salsa Congress runs at the Westin O'Hare all weekend with dance workshops, performances, and concerts. You'll find more information on the schedule and registration on our website. Well, I'm sorry, that's going to be our show for this weekend. That's it. And don't forget also to tune in to Noticias Univision Chicago every weekday morning. I'll be waiting for you. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices, I'm Alex Hernandez. Muy buenas noches. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that is proud to be a multilingual law firm that provides translators for a variety of languages.